on a very foggy night. And it took place on a bridge similar to the I-55 bridge that goes from Laplace to Hammond. Most of you, I believe, are probably familiar with that bridge. It just goes on. It's kind of like the bridge over the Chapalaya Swamp. It just goes on and on. In fact, I was pretty sure that's where the incident took place, was on that bridge, but Kathy and I researched some information, and though we did determine there was a similar event that took place on that bridge in 1976, that occurred during the day, and there are no other similar details to the story I'm about to recount to you. In the 1976 event, as in the story I'm about to tell, there was a tugboat that struck the pilings, causing the bridge to collapse. Um, in my account of the similar event, it occurred there as well. But it occurred at night under very foggy conditions. There are two characters in my story. Well, actually, there's three. And I'll remember the third one. The two characters in my event both were traveling on the bridge in the same direction, about 30 minutes apart. Now we're going to call them Smith and Jones <laughs> because that's what came to mind. With Smith being the driver of the first car that began to cross the bridge and Jones coming later. As Smith began to cross the bridge, he realized that his headlights were starting to fade. He was concerned his alternator was going out. <laughs> Knowing that the drive across the bridge would take some 20 to 30 minutes, Smith began to drive, praying his battery would last long enough to power the headlights so that he could get to the other side and find a payphone to call for assistance. As he drove, Smith's worst fears began to materialize as his headlights began to fade and faded to the place where he could no longer see in the fog. And he came, to, he came to a complete stop on the bridge, blocking a lane of traffic. There was no place to get off the road. As he sat there in his car, trying to decide a course of action, he suddenly felt the bridge sway underneath the car. And he heard the collision of the tugboat several hundred yards in front of him. He had no clue what happened. All he knew is something was not right. So he grabbed a flashlight out of the glove box and he began to walk toward the source of the sound that he had heard. And after walking slowly for several minutes, he was focused on the light of his flashlight on the pavement in front of him. And the, flat, and the, the pavement under the flashlight suddenly disappeared. And Smith realized he was walking on a bridge that had collapsed in front of him. So he slowly backed away from the edge and then he turned and he ran to his car. It was his first thought, there's my place of safety, let me get to the car. But again, what was he gonna do? Cars would be coming. Cars with at least one person in each one Maybe more, maybe, maybe even a family, maybe a family leaving town on vacation. All the thoughts start going through his mind about the traffic. He knows it's coming. And he knew he had to warn him, but how? So he came up with a game plan and he decided to wait at his car until he saw someone coming. And as soon as he saw him coming, he would wave his flashlight at them, bringing them to, to a stop. He'd explain the situation, and then he'd have them turn around and drive back to find help and to notify the police. That's the best thing you could think of at the time, and I don't know that any of the rest of us would have thought of anything better. And he didn't have long to wait before the first car um, he was watching for began to approach. And Smith stood at the back of his vehicle and frantically waved his flashlight, you know, so that they would see it. It's still foggy, but he's, he's just waving that flashlight like crazy. And he stood at the back of the vehicle, waved the flashlight at the oncoming car, and the vehicle began to slow as it approached him. But just before Smith could motion the driver to roll down his window, the driver evidently decided, I don't know what's going on here, and I'm not comfortable with this. And he hit the gas, and he floored it, and he went screeching right over the edge of the bridge. 
Smith watched in agony as the taillights disappeared and he heard the car strike the surface of the water a few moments later. And before he, could, he had time to consider what had just transpired, a second vehicle appeared coming through the fog. <clears throat> Again, Smith frantically waved his, his flashlight, but this car barely even slowed down before speeding past him toward the end of the road. And this same scenario was repeated several more times before Smith changed his plan. Enter Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is now traveling towards Smith's car and all he could see was the flashlight being pointing toward him. It wasn't waving, it was just a single beam pointing toward him. And so Jones slowed down and as he cautiously approached the beam, he picked up on the shape of a vehicle that he was coming upon and, and he realized that the beam was pointed at him through the rear window and out the, the, the front windshield. He continued to slow as he pulled up alongside of Smith's car, focusing on the beam of light before slamming on his brakes as Smith stepped out in front of the car. He just stepped out in front. Jones hesitated for, for just a moment as he began to put the car in reverse and tried to understand what Smith was screaming at him. Jones finally realized as he was beginning to back away that Smith was screaming repeatedly, Stop! The bridge is out! The bridge is out! Stop! Stop! Jones then understood. He put it in park and he cautiously opened the door as Smith approached him and he came and tears were just streaming down his face and he, he continued shouting, Stop! Stop! Uh, the bridge is out. So Jones exited his vehicle and, and he attempted to calm Smith, who began saying that no one would stop. You are the first one. No one would stop. Jones began to understand the nightmare that Smith had been experiencing. He turned to his car, he turned it around, he backed up next to Smith's car with his headlights on. And together, the two of them were able to turn the next oncoming car around and send them for help. You know, Smith, he didn't know the people who were driving the first cars. He'd never met them. He didn't know whether they were good people or bad. He didn't know whether they were kind or if they were evil. He didn't know whether they deserved or needed a second chance at life or not. He just knew he was the only one available at that particular moment in time to save them from sure death. After having failed with the first cars, and I really don't know whether there were four cars or, or four dozen cars, but he finally decided that the only other thing he knew to do was to step out in front of the car. Even if it simply ran him down. He had to do something more drastic than just wave a flashlight. Because they were just not quite willing to trust the one holding the light in the middle of the darkness. <laughs> you know, you and I, we pass by people every day that we don't know. Yeah. we likely will never meet them unless we choose to step out and introduce ourselves. We don't know whether they're good or bad. We don't, we don't know whether they're kind or evil. We don't know whether they deserve to be saved or even if they, they're in need of being saved or not. We just don't know. But you know, we just might be the last chance they might have in their life of coming to know the one who can save them. Jesus, Jesus, however, he knows everything about those people, whether they're good or bad, and he already chose to die for each one of them. Yes. Just as he did for you and me. And one quick question I have for you is, which do you think would be more important to Jesus? Saving someone from a sure death 
or bringing that very same person to salvation. I'm going to tell you, I think there's many in the church who would rather risk death, would rather risk death and take a bullet for someone. Someone that they never met. Rather than take a moment to introduce themselves to a stranger and ask if they know Jesus. So what does the word say about, about the bad people? About the evil ones. You know, the people that we know, we know they don't even deserve a second chance. So let's look at chapter 1 of Romans, where Paul is addressing the people, all who were in Rome, beloved of God, and called to be saints. Understand, he's addressing beloved of God, called to be saints. We're looking at chapter 1, and we're going to be starting at verse 18. Verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth of unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. What Paul's speaking of here is, is that what may be known of God is made manifest in all men. Not just the Christian, not just the Jew. And God has even revealed what may be known about himself to all men. All those who are lost have already been given this knowledge. Verse 20. For since the creation of his world, of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Church, in all of creation, we can walk outside and we can look around us and see the majesty of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yep. I tell people all the time, you see all those trees? All these trees out here. They're covered in leaves. Yeah. Covered in leaves. Yeah. And no two of those leaves are identical. That's right. None. Not in any tree in all of creation. Mm -hmm. the, the leaves on the same tree may have the same similar shapes. But if you hold one leaf up against another, they are not identical. Amen. We can look at the beauty of his highest mountains and the mountain peaks towering over, over the plains and, and understand they just didn't spring up from nowhere. Orchids and the lilies of the field, they don't just happen. We have farmers who plant their seeds in the spring, men and women, who understand that if you put seeds in the dirt cover them up and wait for the spring rains, there's a crop that's going to come forth. It's like magic up out of the ground. Hallelujah. Just as if they were created to do so. Brother. And these plants, they produce all varieties of good tasting foods, which, which provide us the sustenance required to live, to grow, to maintain life. The rains also supply us with the water which we require to live. Amen. All of nature testifies to us that there is a creator. And what Paul is saying is, is that man can look around him at the evidence of God and yet they will see it and they choose. They decide to suppress the truth in unrighteousness and ungodly behavior. He continues on in verse 22 about these men. These men, professing to be wise, they become fools. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. In the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. 
Paul writes of men describing themselves as wise. I don't know about you. I know some people who really think they're very wise. Most of them have a college degree. <laughs> yep. Who even up to today, up to this very day, become fools. That's right. Oh, man. And change the glory of God into images made by men. Images to be worshipped. Yes. Sometimes little statues. Things placed in positions of honor before God himself. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, honoring the creation rather than the creator. Even today among men, they place a greater value on the egg of an animal than they do a child who is made in the image of God. You know, to disturb a nest of sea turtle eggs can result in a man being jailed and financially penalized without question. But the unborn child is destroyed and cast aside without thought Amen. or penalty to the parents by law enforcement or legislators. Even today, in the most blessed of nations, God's treasures, our children, his crowning glory are violated in the womb. In verse 26, Paul tells us, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. Amen. This is where man was 2,000 years ago. This is where man still is yeah. today. Yeah. Knowing the righteous judgment of God, knowing that those who practice such things, Paul says they are deserving of death. Not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them, even in the church. Paul tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all such as these. And yet even still, even still, church, our God, he is long-suffering. Our God is merciful. Our God is full of grace. He is forgiving and he is loving, including these. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When they come to the place of repentance. Right. But how shall they know of such a place unless there are those who are willing to risk telling them? Right. But who are unwilling to stand by and watch them rush toward death and destruction. How will they know unless there are those who are unwilling to stand by and do nothing? Even if it means they must step out in front of them and risk possibly being run down. The Apostle Peter, he who, who himself denied Christ three times on the day of his betrayal, three times on his way to the cross, Peter who was forgiven much, after the Lord's resurrection, wrote to believers everywhere in 2 Peter chapter 3 that this earth and the heavens are preserved for fire on the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. He also said this in verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us and not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Amen. Amen. The promise Peter was referring to here was judgment. God's judgment. 
of the unrighteous and the ungodly. God is not slack concerning his promise, but rather he is long-suffering. He is patient. He is so extremely patient, church, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not willing that the same people Paul was writing about should perish. He's not okay with it, church. He wants them to repent of their sin that they may live. And nor is he slack concerning his judgment for us. We who may very well have been set in place to tell the unrighteous, the ungodly about this God who has loved them since before their birth, since before the foundations of the earth. This God who wants to spend eternity with them just as much as he wants to spend it with us. Amen. And if you think about it for even just a moment, you see, we were all once one of those. I knew there was a God. I knew who Jesus was. He provided Christmas. But I did not know him. I still knew what was right and what was wrong, but I sure didn't like being reminded of either. I didn't want to retain God in my knowledge. I didn't want to think about what he was thinking about what I was doing. And so God gave me over to a debased mind. And I did those things which were not fitting. I was not a bad guy by the world standards. But I was my God. But even so, he had mercy on me. Thank you, Lord. And he sought me. Thank you, Lord. And he put people, places, and things in my pathway to bring me to him. And now I choose to be one of those whom he puts in the pathway of others. Others whom he has given over to a debased mind that I can tell them about the Jesus so that, that maybe they will come to salvation. Woo! To spend eternity with him as well. Hallelujah. Amen. And now as we start to head to our close, we're not there yet. <laughs> we're just turning that direction. Okay. Thank you, I want to ask you to please listen closely to the words of the prophet Isaiah coming from chapter 55 of his writings, starting at verse 6. Church Isaiah wrote, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Amen. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, for he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. During our time with the Experiencing God study, I don't know about the rest of you, but I truly hear the Lord saying, we need to seek Him right. steadfastly, earnestly, calling upon Him, for He is yet near. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. He's telling us here, He's telling us that we need to let the wicked forsake His way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. And listen again to what the word says. He is telling us to let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man, his thoughts. We are to let them return to the Lord. We are to embrace them right. and let them return to the Lord. Yeah. For he will have mercy on them and he will abundantly pardon them. Many churches are isolating themselves from the unrighteous. Right. They are avoiding the ungodly. They are sharing Jesus only with each other. Amen. And they're hiding him from the world. 
Just hide him inside our church. We all got Jesus. You got Jesus. I got Jesus. We all got Jesus. <laughs> Break it, brother. Come Quick, on. lock the door. Somebody might be out there coming in. Come on. Come on. I do know a pastor who locks the door on his his church wow. when service starts. If you're late for service, you're not late. You ain't gonna be there. Amen. And so will be those who drive by and think, "I need to go talk to somebody." Yep. They will not be able to get in. Thank you, Lord. But that's. Not us. That's right. That is not this church. That's right. And yet other churches are embracing not just the unrighteous and the ungodly, they're also embracing their sin as well. They're losing their own identity in Christ by accepting the sins and they're blending their identity with that of the world. God loves the sinner where he is, but he loves him enough not to leave him there. Right. Amen. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Church, I, I've read this a lot of times, and, and listen to me. I, I hear people saying, this is God rebuking man. Telling him that, that my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. Church, I don't hear him rebuking us, saying that we are incapable of his thoughts. I do not hear him saying that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, let's back up a little bit. I do not hear him saying that we have no power to work in his ways. I hear the Lord chastising us, yes. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. Because our ways are not his ways. But I believe he's asking, why? Mm. Yep. Why? Right. For you see, we have the mind of Christ. Mm. Amen. His thoughts should be our yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Amen. Our ways should be his ways. We have dwelling within us the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Yes. His way should be our ways. Yes. Yeah. We each one have, we have this book. And in this book, it tells us of his thoughts. Yeah. Yes. It tells us of his ways. Thank you, Lord. We have the records of his ways going back to the beginning of this world, as we would recognize it. We have the Holy Spirit within us that knows the heart and the mind of God, and we have access to Him 24-7. Yeah. His thoughts should be our thoughts, and His ways should be ours as well. Amen. Verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Why? Why? I believe that's His thought. Why? We should have the same as His. Our ways should be the same. Our thoughts should be the same as His. For as the rain come down, comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my words be that go forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Church, if we are the hands and feet of God, if we are His mouthpiece proclaiming the truth of the gospel, telling people of His love and His mercy, declaring His righteousness and His holiness, those words should not come back void, but should accomplish what God pleases and prosper in the thing for which He sent it. We can't preach the gospel except by the will of God. If we do without his backing, then we're, we're living in a dream. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to go forth and proclaim the truth. Come on. Come on. He is who he is, and he is the great I am. We belong to him. We are his, and we are to be sharing 
his thoughts, and his ways with the world, with the lost and dying, with the hurting and the sick, with the hungry and the thirsty. Listen, his thoughts may exceed all human imagination, yes. We can't think like he can. But when he gives us his thoughts, we have them. In this book, the Holy Scriptures, he has shared them with us that we may share them with others. And that is why he provided us with it. Amen. 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 And if that doesn't fire you up, I don't know what good what will. God is sitting on his throne, watching over the affairs of men, and I'm telling you, he's thinking, why are they not doing this? Why are they not doing more? Why are they sitting back on their dust watching the NFL when people are dying in the streets without Christ? Is that good or what? He is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Church, he... The Lord God Almighty is able to do exceedingly, yep. abundantly, above all that we ask or think. He's able to do more than we can even imagine. According to the power that works in us. According to His power. His Holy Ghost power working within us. And to Him be glory in the church. Amen. What we do, what we allow Him to do through us. Through us. Amen. Come on. Brings him glory in the church by Christ yeah. Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Yes, Lord. What he does through us brings him glory in the church throughout all generations. Glory in the church. But what we don't do, what we do not allow him to do through us, results in heartache and leads to judgment those who are rushing for the pathway that leads to destruction. The path that leads to death, to torment throughout all generations forever and ever because they have no Smiths and Jones who are willing to step out in front of them shouting, stop. Stop. There is no bridge here to freedom. There is no bridge on your pathway to healing. There is no bridge that you're going to travel that takes you to the Lord. That bridge does not exist on the path at all. What Smith and later Jones had to decide is what we have to decide. Are we willing to let those who are blinded by fog or by deception, or willing to allow them to continue moving toward death, knowing what their end will be, without even attempting to stop them. And yes, many will pass us by, rushing headlong to eternal damnation, because they too are not quite willing to trust the one who's holding on to the light in the midst of the darkness. I believe God allows, allowed Smith's car to break down that night on that bridge that he might be there to save people headed to destruction. Amen. Amen. And while he could not save them all, his presence did save many because of the message he gave them. The bridge is out. Death lies ahead. I believe Smith was a part of God's plan then just as we are a part of his plan today. Amen. To play that same role. To give warning to those to whom we are able. Kathy and I were talking on Thursday morning about some of the same topics. <laughs> about our nation. Like we did Thursday night, guys. About it becoming more and more and more of an unrighteous and an ungodly nation right before our eyes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And while our God is long-suffering, loving and merciful, at some point, he will have to say, 
you know, and pass judgment upon the nations, including the United States of America. And while we were, di we were discussing this, I mean, Kathy left the room. <clears throat> I think I had to go brush my teeth and, and as I'm headed in there, just moments after we spoke, I felt the Lord say to me, I am still waiting patiently. I'm giving time to the remnant to act. To bring salvation to many before I determine to take action against the nation. That remnant is us. It is us and other churches, other groups like us, other believers, people who are willing to act in behalf of those we've been talking about. Those who are rushing to destruction. Those who are needing a Smith or a Jones to stop them in their tracks, to direct them to stop, to turn and head in the opposite direction. They might be saved. As we close today, we will give an altar call in a few minutes. And church, I want everybody here who believes God is calling them to a Smith and Jones type ministry, as we've discussed. At that time, I want you to come to the altar that we might pray with and for each other. But I have a few more points to make this morning, and then we'll make the altar call. Kathy, I forgot to ask you for a song, but if you can I want to play during the altar call. I appreciate it. Do you have one in mind? Huh? Do you have one in mind? Let it rain. No, I trust you. <laughs> the first point I want to make this morning is in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and verse 15. Jesus made the simple statement. If you love me, keep my commandments. So what are the Lord's commandments? Here's a few of them. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul wrote these words. This is one of my favorite verses. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. What Paul is saying is we have no idea what God has prepared, prepared for those who love him. But what did Jesus about say about those who love him? Will obey. They will keep his commandments. So we could also say Paul was telling us we have no idea what God has prepared for those who obey him. Secondly, in day five of, of this past week's unit five of the Experience of God study, this line really stuck out to me. Henry Blackaby wrote this line. God creates in me the desire to participate in his mission to reconcile a lost world to himself. These words are really very personal to me because I believe God has created the same desire within me. And my hope is that he'll do so with every person in the sanctuary. Amen. And lastly, in 1873, a British revivalist, I always thought Kathy and me and Carla Murray created that word. Revivalist? Revivalist. <laughs> we used to call each other oh, revivalists. And then I read it in a book somewhere and I went, <laughs> mm -mm. In 1873, a British revivalist named Henry Barley 
he made this statement to Dwight Moody, who became one of the 19th century's greatest evangelists. Barley said to him, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. To which Moody later responded, by God's help, I plan to be that man. By God's help, I plan to be that man. I hope today's message has encouraged some of you. I hope it's inspired some of you. And maybe even convicted some of you to come forward now as we pray together. <laughs> For God to reveal his will to you and to us in this area of our ministry. And I know some of you that are here are, are already involved in these efforts. And I know that. But I also believe God is looking for more of us, for more from us. <laughs> we have here in this room three different types of people. We have those who are rushing blindly toward destruction and maybe don't even know that's the pathway that they're on. We have those whose hearts are breaking because others are on that pathway. And they're struggling, scrambling, trying to do everything they can to keep people from heading in that direction. <coughs> and we have those whose desire is to come alongside of them and help them in what they're doing. We have those traveling to destruction, and we have Smiths, and we have Jones. I believe in my heart, every person in this room knows who they are. Right. And if you are one of those, I would ask you to come up to the altar now. Let us pray together first for those who are rushing toward destruction. For those who are who are struggling, trying to to turn the tide, who are willing even to step in front of them, and for those who are willing to come up beside them and assist them.